160 miles southeast is the city of Portsmouth, which lies on Port Sea Island in the Solent. The port's strategic position in the Channel has given it a central role in naval history. At the height of the British Empire, it was the world's most fortified military base. Today, the local lifeboat crew keep the seas safe from their base on Langstone Harbour. Right, chappies, we're just practicing some rope work. If you can, uh, all tie bowling for us. 24-year-old Brittany has been volunteering here for over five years. So I'm from Portsmouth, lived here all my life, uh, grew up here. It's basically an island filled with water around it. <laughs> Busy station here as well. A lot of the time in the summer, you're kind of looking more for casualty care jobs or people going missing and spending a bit more time out on the water, and we'll go and search for them. The Portsmouth lifeboat station is at the centre of three linked natural harbours, between them home to hundreds of dinghies and yachts. You've got people out there that are really experienced, and yet stuff still goes wrong. So sometimes we are our worst enemy, but then sometimes things just go wrong. A warm day in June. The inland waters appear calm, but beyond the harbour, a strong wind is creating choppy seas with large swells. A call comes into the station. Two dinghies have capsized. Four people are in the water over a mile out to sea. The casualties that we went out to were quite a long way offshore for the size of boats they were in. I think the, the wooden dinghies they were in were 10 to 12 foot long, so they weren't big. Sailing dinghies had the potential to sink. I wouldn't say that they were in the, the safest place that they could be. When you capsize, it's a lot more serious and a lot more time critical that you need to get there because someone can drown in 90 seconds. It's really important that you get there quickly. It was quite choppy. The wind had picked up a little bit as well, so it was, you know, you're kind of thinking, how far have they drifted? Um, you know, have they managed to get any of their boats back up yet? You know, are they with their boats or is it four singular people in the water just kind of bobbing around and we've got to search for them and try and find each one? It takes four minutes for the Atlantic class to reach the casualty's last known location. But there's only one dinghy and just two people clinging on. A passing motorboat has picked up the other two sailors, but this dinghy has now drifted over a half a mile away from their friends. As we got to the first casualties, they were pointing over to where this motorboat was, but as we were with them and the fact that the other casualties were in or on another vessel, we went for the first capsized boat, as they were still in the water and the other ones weren't. The challenge now is getting these two men out of the water. It can be quite difficult depending on like the size of your casualty, especially when you've got you know kit on that then weighs them down as well. So they've got you know water on their kit or soaked into their kit, so it weighs a bit more once you start lifting them out of the water. The exhausted casualties have been clinging onto their dinghy in choppy seas for nearly an hour. There we go. Oh. Okay. Oh. There we go. I'll hold that one. When you're dealing with people in the water, you kind of just look at getting them in and assessing how they are, if they were cold at all, um, have they swallowed any water, have they inhaled any water, just to see if they're going to need treatment from us. With two casualties now safe, the crew must locate the other members of their group. But as the lifeboat approaches the motor cruiser, it becomes clear that one of these sailors is not completely out of danger yet. I saw that there was one gent sitting on the back of the swim deck, um, and the lady that was on the boat had handed him a towel. I thought at first it was just to kind of dry him off a little bit. 
Um, and as we got a bit closer, he said that he'd hurt his leg. A crew member needs to board the motor cruiser to properly assess the sailor's injury. But as they come alongside, they learn that this boat has problems of its own. The motorboat had actually got a, uh, a rope around its propeller, so it was just drifting in the swell and with the wind. They'd only just picked up that motorboat that day, so they were quite new to that boat themselves and uh, had attempted to rescue them got into a sticky situation themselves. Maneuvering the 27-foot, 1.8-tonne lifeboat alongside a drifting vessel in these seas is no mean feat. But Lewis must get Brittany on board. The laceration that he had, it was a bit more than just a cut. It was, it was quite big, I'd probably say maybe six to seven inches um, long. There were quite a lot of waves kind of coming over and almost washing the blood off. Um, but he was also quite cold as well. Um, so that was, I believe, kind of almost stemming the bleeding that was coming out. I asked for a first aid kit um, to be sent over along with another crew member. Kim joins Brittany on the motor cruiser. He did seem quite kind of relaxed, but I think it was more just trying to keep himself calm. He was quite cold as well. We did need to get his leg treated properly because we, we can only do so much on the boat. While Kim runs preliminary medical checks, Brittany dresses the man's laceration. You imagine getting out of a swimming pool onto the side he tried to do that onto the boat but as he was doing it he'd actually caught his leg on the propeller the injured sailor phil and his crewmate paul were adrift in the sea for nearly an hour before the motor cruiser spotted them the reason the dinghy capsized was mainly because a freak gust of wind just come straight at us there was no warning. Initially, it was quite worrying. My heart did pump and my adrenaline did kick in. It was just total shock. Without the life jacket, I wouldn't be here now talking about it. I wasn't too sure how far we were getting dragged out because you get quite disorientated and getting tired, getting very, very tired. As time went by, I was getting colder and colder and colder, and I was thinking, is there anybody going to come and get us? I did say to Phil, we need some help soon, so I'm not too sure how long I can hold on for. I was just so pleased when this passing vessel come in to get us. Phil's leg needs urgent medical attention. So the priority now is to get him and Paul off this boat. While Paul can board with little assistance, the bigger challenge is transferring a wounded man off a broken down motor cruiser, which without engine power is now rolling in increasingly choppy seas. The injured guy, we managed to get him up and onto his feet. He was actually pretty good. He managed to hop over quite elegantly, actually. <laughs> Finally, four casualties, two dinghies and a drifting motor cruiser are all transported back to harbour. The guys were reasonably lucky to be spotted by the passing motorboat. If the vessel had sunk, then would have run the risk that we were just effectively looking for heads in the water. They could have been out there until like the hours of darkness. If they started to like lose consciousness, they might have drifted away from their boat. They wouldn't have stayed with that. They might have let go and. Yeah, trying to find four people that aren't with their boats compared to four people that are with their boat is a lot harder. <laughs> How lucky was it that day? It's the closest I've come to death, I think. Um, yes, very lucky. You're clear, you're clear. Safely ashore, the casualties are met by a waiting ambulance crew. The people that we rescued, they came round to every crew member afterwards and said their thanks, which for us, it means a lot. I met Phil a couple of weeks ago. We had a little survivor's drink down in Eastbourne. Um, Phil's okay, because the wound was quite wide, it's still healing, but hopefully he should be 
back fighting fit soon. Four lives have been saved today, but the Portsmouth crew won't be able to return to their families and friends just yet. We've got another job to go to, so uh, hop back on. <laughs> no rest on a Sunday, then. Oh, no, never is. <laughs> By the time we got back from the second show, it must have been about 7 o'clock. Yeah, my barbecue was finished. With limestone cliffs rising hundreds of feet, the Gower Peninsula in Wales is home to some of Britain's most breathtaking scenery. Its many beaches and bays are popular with surfers and kayakers. But with strong tides and currents, the waters here can be dangerous. The Gower Peninsula is quite an interesting piece of coast, so we have a mixture of uh, cliffs which are followed around by the Welsh coastal path. And we also have little coves and sandy beaches, which offer a really good place for people to come and enjoy the coast, enjoy the sea, and uh, hopefully enjoy the sun when it comes out. 22-year-old Aidan has been a lifeguard here for three years. I've always loved being around water. I swam from when I was very young and grew up swimming and being in the sea and in the pool and stuff, and it just seemed like pretty cool to be able to work at the beach every day. The lifeguards here are supported by the Mumbles lifeboat crew, and the popularity of their patch means that this station is the busiest in Wales. Um, Mumbles, yeah, we have a lot of people involved in water sports. Like on the water today, there's people kayaking, fishing, paddleboarding, swimming. The sea looks so inviting, it's definitely tempting to get involved. But there's one small watercraft which is the bane of life-saving crews here and around the country. Yeah, when here in Flatwell, you definitely don't think of it as a, the most seaworthy craft. So if there's any chop, they're going to struggle in it. And even if it's windy, they're going to struggle to maintain their position against the wind. So if you're in something at Flatwell that sits on top of the water, um, you're most likely going to be blown away from the land, so you're going to struggle to get back to your safety. A warm spring day in the Gower. The lifeboat station is paged. Two young men have been seen drifting out to sea in a small inflatable kayak. The questions that we generally sort of want answered as we're sort of processing the information coming in, I guess, are what ages they might be, what kind of clothing are they wearing, how far away from the shoreline are they, um, are they in the water, holding onto the kayak, are they in the kayak and, you know, safe enough. I've got my keys in my shorts and my parents are asking for them. The lifeboat station is a few miles from the kayaker's last reported position. How long? 15 minutes? Yeah. While the inshore boat makes its way to the scene, Aidan can see the unfolding emergency from the beach. On the binoculars, the boys were quite far out in the kayaks. We could see the boys were trying to paddle in the opposite direction and they were making no leeway at all, so it was, it was obvious from that point that the, the boys may need a bit of, a bit of assistance. Watching the kayak continue to drift out to sea, Aidan decides to take action. I was already in my wetsuit and the board was water's edge ready to go, so I ran down and paddled the board out in the direction of where the boys were. By the time the lifeboat arrives on the scene, Aidan has reached the drifting inflatable and secured it to a passing boat. But it's soon apparent that the bigger problem is the state of the kayakers. As the kayakers take refuge on the motorboat, it's clear they've been having a bit of a party. Good. That's your problem. Yeah, I can imagine. So when we approached the vessel that had um, taken the the guys on on a tow, it was you know pretty apparent that they'd had a lot of beer and there was still quite a lot of it in the boat as well. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way this is going to get towed around to there. It's waterlogged. They're in a bit of a state. The casualties are transferred to the lifeboat. They're safe, but worse for wear and freezing cold. Alright, do you want to put that on? Uh, put that on, please. Right, you can see that pole to put your head through. 
I think the, the type of clothing they're wearing reflects sometimes how often they use the water. These guys didn't have the kit. They were wearing jumpers and coats and things and no life jacket. And it's not just the kayakers' clothes that are unseaworthy. The kayak was quite an old inflatable kayak. I mean, it was afloat and it was pumped up fine, but it had taken on quite a lot of water as well. It looked quite old. <laughs> Hey, awesome boat ball. Yeah, just for your information, uh, we've currently got the boys on board. The priority now is to get the Merry Mariners warmed up and back on dry land. Are you, are you carrying all these cans back up with you? Yes, I'm with my boys. <laughs> Can I have one in front, though? One of the lads, you know, was pretty aware that he was like, OK, I need to have my serious head on here. And then the other lad, I think, was just wanting to carry on drinking. Well, then can I say one little preachy thing? Go on, Anna. Please, please, just get life jackets next time you're on the water. Right. Yeah, no, that's Promise. Because that'll save you life. Experience, no. isn't it? I think they were pretty unaware of potentially how severe that situation could have been for them. So, yeah. Yeah, go on, yeah. If the lifeguard wasn't there and the vessel that helped them wasn't there, they could have easily been adrift and, and continued to, you know, go out into the channel, which would made searching and locating them very difficult as well. So, yeah, could have been quite serious. For now, the lads' booze cruise is over. They took the beers with them. They were appreciative. Uh, I think they were happy to get out of that situation. Um, pleased to be back on dry land. Each shout presents its own challenges. I think you've got to have a level head, I suppose, and with that comes patience. Um, Patience to listen to people, patience to not panic somebody, patience just to kind of go with the flow, I suppose, a little bit if someone's being a bit silly. Our job isn't to judge anyone for their behaviour or what they're doing on any given day. I think the only thing to bear in mind is that on that day, two lifeboats were launched and a lifeguard was taken off the beach that they were meant to be patrolling. For volunteers and their families, one of the hardest things to adjust to is the fact that they have no idea where, why or when they could be called into action. If there's a Sunday lunch, you sat down, your pager goes off, you go. You know, if you're bathing your kids, your pager goes off, you go. If you're reading a story to the kids, your pager goes off, you go. One of my first shouts was my boy's first birthday. The party sat at 2 o'clock and the pager went off at 5 to 2. So I missed his first birthday. <laughs> Christmas Day was the worst. Just about to sit down for Christmas lunch and the pager went off. <phone rings> to be fair, they did keep the dinner on hold, but it was a bit dry when we got back. Please clear the area. I don't think my colleagues really realise what it involves. If my pager goes off in the middle of the night, I do have to get up and cycle down the cliff in a storm and get on the boat. <laughs> I've just gone out past three. Two hours before work. Yeah. <laughs> there was a time the pager went off my nan's funeral. It was a bit like, all right, we've got to come and kind of respect you, Nan, but at the same time, you know that this is what we do. I make sure now that when we go out, I've got spare house keys, mobile phone and money for a taxi because I, we can be anywhere and he's gone. And <laughs> he's just left me. Mid-May in Cornwall, and the new key lifeboat station has been paged again. Someone's been cut off by the tide. The crew have only just returned from another shout. Got home, went to Sainsbury's, bought myself a four pack of beer. It's a Heineken Cup final, isn't it? I thought I watched the rugby, have a couple of beers. It can be frustrating sometimes. If you've just rushed down for the middle of doing something you're enjoying doing. When you get tasked, it's something that's easily avoidable, but that's the nature of the beast. A woman and her dog are trapped by the incoming tide at the Druthan Steps Beach, over five miles from Newquay by sea. That area is notorious, really. Over a matter of only a few days, maybe a week, we had been called to this same place, the Druthan Steps, three times in a row. To increase their chances of finding the casualty, both of the station's boats are launched. The larger, faster Atlantic class and the smaller D class, better suited to beach landings. 
Uh, so it's a woman and a box of dogs. She sounds like she's rang it in. Yeah. I think they're set on the southern side, so I think like they're oh, this side of the cave. Yeah, yeah, turn left. For Trudden Steps, there's lots of rocks, some that you can go behind, some that you can't. Very flat beach. One minute they're walking along with 10, 20 metres of golden sands in front of them, and then 20 minutes later, they're stood on the rocks, wondering how they're going to get back. The first thoughts when we're going up there is finding her. They're obviously going to be frightened and afraid if they've had to make an emergency call. As soon as she's got eyes on us, she's going to feel a whole lot better about the situation. What I do is I'll go start south side. Unfortunately, at Bedreeton Steps, the tide actually cuts you off only a couple of hours after low tide, so there would have been nowhere for her to escape. She's probably in here somewhere. The Atlantic arrives on the scene first, and the crew set about trying to locate the casualty. Something, something blue there. Oh, what's that there? Is that a person with a blue jacket? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and the yeah. brown dog. Yeah. Right. When you spot the person and you can see that they're on sort of dry land and at that time look to be unharmed, it's a relief straight away because um, you know that then you've got time um, to be able to sit back and assess the situation. The two crews decide to send a smaller D-class in through the surf to the beach to pick up the casualty and her dog. Engine's on tilt, we going straight to the clean beach, straight in, we'll get in, beach it. If you go up, Rafa and that and me and Ross... With the flood tide, the sooner we've got them in and the more beach we have to aim for, the easier it is for us as crew. If we get in and it's tight up against the cliffs, um, trying to hold the boat in place can be very difficult. Yeah, you're all good behind. The woman has been stranded for over half an hour, with the tide still coming in fast all around her. Hi there. When I saw the boat arrive, there was a tremendous sense of relief. You do feel lonely when you're in trouble near the sea. When you're faced with a rising tide, it was something that I couldn't see my way out of. You OK? Yeah, I'm so yeah. upset that sure? I did it wrong. No, it's fine. <laughs> it's a really notorious place to get cut off, so it happens a lot, so don't worry at all. She was distressed, understandably. You know, it's a lonely experience. You're generally cut off, isolated. You know, you look around you, there's high cliffs. You think, you know, nobody's ever going to see you. It's quite mentally stressful. Okay. What's the dog's name? Cooper. Cooper? So is he quite friendly to be picked up and that? Yeah. I was upset because I was having to ask for help because I'm a fiercely independent person and I really didn't like to ask for help and I kept wanting to find my own way back but I realised I couldn't. I couldn't believe that it was so high so soon because high tide was at least three hours away and I started to panic. I then tried to climb over some of the rocks calling Cooper to come with me but it, they were already wet and my feet were slipping and I bashed my shins and I realised that if I didn't stop, I could be in far greater danger. I could, have, I could hurt myself. What we'll do is we'll take you out through the, through the small little waves on the small one and we'll get you on the nice big one. It's really solid. I panicked because I was worried for my safety and I was worried for Cooper as well. He puts his absolute trust in me. I felt totally powerless. So if you put this one on you, perhaps pop that up, because it's going to get splashed a little bit. I was still quite upset because I still felt I should have done something to not get myself in that situation, but I felt that I'd done everything right. I didn't realise I would be in that situation. OK. I'll just help you hold Cooper there. The tides and the conditions change daily, obviously, the size of the tides, but actually the sand shifts a lot as well on a daily basis. So the particular cove she was in is, is the first one that gets cut off. So, 
you know, really everything was sort of against her, even though she she tried her best. You know, she had made the effort. It's not like she's, you know, naively gone down there and, and taken risks. So, you know, it's things just went against her, and but she did everything right. Just, just little splashes over the top, nothing coming into the boat. Just hold on. on these sort of shouts, a little bit of continuity with dealing with someone is, is really beneficial for the casualty. So, obviously, I was the first one to speak to Linda, so, you know, I remained sort of close to her, reassuring her while we're in the, in the D-class smaller lifeboat. Good boy. Good boy. And then I actually transferred with her and Cooper, the dog, onto the Atlantic, just for that continuity of, you know, a, a familiar face. Okay. I'm going to stand you up, Linda. I'm going to pass you on to these punky gentlemen on the other side. Turn around, put one foot on. Good. Good boy, good boy. That's it, good boy. The 10 or 15 minute journey back to the harbour, it seemed like a lifetime because it was so cold, windy and wet. You right there? Comfy? All the while we were on the boat, he was crouched down, his arms around Cooper, reassuring him and telling me that he was fine. Cooper, the dog, he was fantastic. Behaved very well. He's a very good dog. I'm sure he had a few treats when he got home. Hey, there's Mummy. You okay there, Linda? Yeah. Bit windy when you're going along, isn't it? But <laughs> it's uh, nice and quiet now. If I could see the guys that rescued me now, I would say thank you for being so understanding and non, -ju non judgmental. And uh, thank you for looking after Cooper. Whoop. Big shake. I would say there's absolutely no reason for you to be embarrassed. Mistakes happen and accidents happen. There's, it's not a big issue for us. Um, it's what we're here for. No problem. Take it okay. easy. Keep enjoying the beach. Keep walking your dog on the beach. You learn the hard way, but don't be embarrassed about it. It's, uh, it's one of those things. <laughs>